Hi everyone. Today, our presentation is on trauma and the inner child. So even if you're not totally familiar with this topic, we know that these concepts can be pretty charged and difficult to talk about. So if at any point you're not totally comfortable with these conversations, then feel free to take whatever space you need. Um, but we do appreciate any thoughts that people do feel comfortable sharing today or just anyone who's able to listen. And when it comes to conversations about trauma, we want to emphasize throughout this presentation open-mindedness and understanding, which are so important. Um, however, we do want to emphasize that our discussion questions today are not going to be asking anyone to share their own personal traumas. And there's so much to be said on this topic, but in the time that we have, we can only cover the tip of the iceberg. And so what we do hope is that this can be a foundation for all of us to build upon for the future. And that being said, our presentation today will focus on traumas or experiences one may have as a child and how these could be connected to one's mental health and well-being as an adult. So to start, we'll do a little bit of definitions. So this idea of the inner child really is believed to originate in um, work from the influential psychiatrist Carl Jung who developed the idea of a child archetype. And this archetype represents our efforts to deal with the problem of growing up and um, all of our potential futures. And the child archetype was seen as a symbol of the developing personality. But a more modern definition describes the inner child as a concept that reflects the child we once were. And that includes both our positive and negative experiences as children. So a healthy inner child might reflect playfulness and innocence, while an injured inner child might reflect distrust or anger. And of course, in all of us, there might be a mix of all those emotions and experiences. Uh, but this inner child and the experiences that it reflects are believed to influence the way we navigate life and relationships in adulthood in a similar way. And there's a type of there's methods called inner child work, um, which consists of intentionally addressing our own inner child, often in conjunction with a mental health professional, and focuses on how childhood experiences, including traumas big and small, affect our thoughts and behaviors now in adulthood. So just after hearing all of that definition about the inner child, we wanted to kind of get a quick feel for um, how everyone is feeling. And is the idea of the inner child new to you or have you connected with it before? Uh, if it is new to you, do you have any thoughts on it? Like I said before, we're not here today to share our own personal traumas, but just, you know, quick right off the bat emotional reactions if anyone's comfortable sharing. Angel says, super intrigued. I've heard of the concept before, but not the specific archetypes. Definitely, that was something um, that was really interesting to me, definitely, while researching this. Um, I think this concept is kind of familiar to a lot of us, but like you said, we don't always have the, the specific words. Spell said, I haven't given it much thought, but after hearing that definition, I'm starting to self-reflect more. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, that is kind of the goal of today's presentation. Like I said, we're, we can't cover everything today, but hopefully what we can do is kind of give you guys a place to start from so that you can, yeah, self-reflect on it a bit and explore where you think is most necessary for you. Okay, we can move on. So now to define trauma a little bit. Um, as a very broad definition, trauma occurs when powerful or dangerous stimuli overwhelm an individual's ability to integrate or regulate their own emotional experience. Um, another definition would be that, you know, obviously there are individual traumas and then we've also heard of generational traumas and stuff like that today will be focusing on individual trauma, which can result from a single event, a series of events, 
or a set of circumstances experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening, even if it might not seem that way to others. And that can have lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and physical, social, and emotional well being. And there are three broad types of trauma that have been defined by mental health professionals. And that includes acute trauma, which usually results from a single incident, such as the death of a loved one, a motor vehicle accident, a natural disaster, or personal violence or assault. Chronic trauma, which results from repeated and prolonged exposure to traumatic events, such as a long-term illness, bullying, domestic violence, or exposure to extreme events like a war. And then there's complex trauma, which involves exposure to varied and multiple traumatic events. And that sounds pretty similar to chronic trauma, but the distinguishing factor here is that the trauma is usually perpetrated by a trusted individual such as a caregiver, um, often involves betrayal, and um, there are some symptoms that are associated more with complex trauma compared to the other two types of trauma, including relational difficulties, a sense of guilt and or shame, low self-esteem, a distorted self-image, dissociations, etc. And these symptoms obviously can be found in some instances of acute or chronic trauma, but they're less common. So now I'm gonna be talking about what trauma can exhibit like in other individuals. And for every individual, trauma can look quite different. And so some common factors that might influence uh, someone's traumatic experiences are First, a troubled childhood, um, some social and financial situations. So this can be like if you grew up with an unstable source of income or struggled to put food on the table, things like that um, can definitely influence your traumatic experiences. Also, familial pressures are a large source of trauma or um, an example of this could be like filial piety. This is common in Asian cultures more so, and it's the idea that uh, we need to respect our ancestors and elders. And so with this goes in hand the uh, pressure to succeed um, and also like the treatment of family members towards you can really influence um, how your childhood is built up and your adulthood is built up. and definitely influence your traumatic experiences. Uh, also, gender roles are a large one. How different cultures see gender is a large factor in terms of how one grows up and develops like experiences. Additionally, level of violence exposure and one's ability to internalize negative situations and sort of cope with that. And Underlying all of these situations could stem from a troubled inner child. So trauma can feel like a collection of emotions and often is quite inexplicable. Um, so you might feel feelings of guilt, sadness, and anger, um, having a constant fear of abandonment, like I said before, possibly like due to a troubled inner child or your traumatic experiences, uh, inappropriate guilt towards yourself and towards others, also having trust issues, lacking self-love, and also traumatic triggers can be quite exhausting and tolling on your life. So for example, if one day you are having a great day and something happens that triggers one of your traumatic experiences that can take a toll on the rest of the day, your, the rest of your week, and it can be really exhausting to deal with. Additionally, um, lots of things can result from trauma in general, and so one can experience troubled relationships, also having increased violence towards others or themselves, like being unable to control their emotions, um, and going hand in hand with traumatic experiences, one can also develop 
many mental illnesses, and these include substance abuse, to possibly cope with these traumatic experiences and how it makes them feel. Also, anxiety-related disorders, as trauma can be quite anxiety-inducing, and also mood disorders. And I just wanted to point out that in the age of COVID-19, lots of these feelings can be quite exacerbated, especially being socially distanced and can often take a toll on mental illnesses and make it worse. And also make these feelings of guilt, sadness, anger, all these feelings that trauma cause can also be exacerbated. And so just going off of the mental illnesses that I previously mentioned, um, there are some uh, illnesses that are trauma related. And one of the most distinct of these are post-traumatic disorder, stress disorder, PTSD. Um, and so what PTSD is, is the exposure or experience of a situation that is traumatic or threatening. And I put stars next to exposure because there's a common misconception that um, people with PTSD are or need to experience the actual traumatic uh, event in order to actually feel traumatized by that, but that often isn't the case. Most people can observe a traumatic event and develop PTSD following that. So also for the diagnosis, according to the DSM, there are four general categories. Um, I just included in parentheses there that these are the minimum amount of criteria that you need for each category. But intrusions, uh, these can feel like flashbacks, and with this, you lose touch with reality. And also avoidance, uh, these can be like avoiding the situation that causes your traumatic experiences. And so that can be avoiding like a certain area of your neighborhood or something like that. And also arousal. Um, arousal can be sleep difficulties, hypervigilance, um, and also being self-destructive and violent. Cognitions and mood. Um, these include amnesia and also self-blame and negative traumatic related emotions. So these are just uh, some general criteria for PTSD. Um, so PTSD relates to the inner child through its mechanism of treatment. And so I just wanted to segue back to this, the left side of the slide uh, where I talk about cognitive behavioral therapy. So um, for PTSD, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the main treatment methods. But this was mainly influenced by the famous psychologist Sigmund Freud. And he did a large study on the unconscious mind. He basically proved to everyone that there was this unconscious that we possess as human beings. And um, it's important to when we're dealing with mental disorders to uncover this unconscious. And he sort of emphasized this idea that therapy was an option for those with mental illnesses and uh, with that came the development of CBT and our modern talk therapies to treat our mental illnesses today. And also, medications aren't a one-size-fits-all. Um, he sort of emphasized that therapies are sometimes more effective than medications. And so um, those are just some common theories by this Sigmund Freud. For PTSD, there is a certain specific CBT that is used called trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. And so the main goal of this is to reduce negative emotional and behavioral responses following trauma. And so this can include avoiding uh, avoidance behaviors, such as avoiding the certain place that causes your trauma and also having unhelpful beliefs. So that can often include self-blame or um, blame towards others. This therapy can also resolve problems in the inner child that lead on to adulthood. And so those are some of the simple mechanisms of this cognitive behavioral therapy. And also they emphasize gradual exposure to traumatic scenarios. And this is often called in vivo exposure. So this can include cognitive restructuring. So that just means um, 
restructuring the way that you think about things. There also is mindfulness and relaxation techniques. So with PTSD, there comes um, high levels of stress and anxiety. And so having these techniques to be able to calm you down during the situations can be super helpful to recovery. Also, there is affective regulation and expression. So um, understanding how you respond to certain traumatic situations can be helpful because this is, again, like the idea of uncovering your unconscious and understanding how you see the world and how you react to um, certain situations that make you have PTSD. And this can also be used to treat other disorders such as anxiety and depression. So another disorder that is trauma-related is um, anxiety-related disorders. So these are, for example, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, panic disorders, and certain phobias. And so these uh, often entail certain situations that induce anxiety, and these can be situations that have happened in the past. And uh, for example, that can include things that have influenced your inner child and how you've developed into adulthood. So this can also be treated similarly with PTSD. Some anxiety disorders are resistant to the traditional anxiety treatments that are commonly used. And so these can also be inner child driven anxiety. And so with anxiety related disorders that are treatment resistant, you often can use exposure therapies, mindfulness, and cognitive restructuring. If that doesn't help, therapists will often go to dialectical behavioral therapy. This is a specific type of CBT, and this focuses more on the social and um, emotional aspects of things and helps with healthy coping mechanisms for stress, emotional regulation, and distress tolerance. I think one concept that is important to address, and one that I personally believe should be held as a standard in all health services, is this approach of trauma-informed care. And if you're unfamiliar with this concept, trauma-informed care is an approach to providing services that really recognize the impact that trauma can have on an individual, and it works to promote a culture of safety empowerment, and healing. And when we provide trauma-informed care, we treat every individual as if they have a history of trauma. With this trauma-informed care approach, we have this mentality switch from what is wrong with this person to what has happened to this person, keeping in mind that the former thought may have been normalized in the past, but this approach is really about reframing so that we can provide informed and compassionate care to the individual. And there are many concepts, um, components, and models that outline trauma-informed care, but I'd like to share one of them coined by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, known as the four R's of trauma-informed care. They stand for realize, recognize, respond, and resist re-traumatization. To realize the widespread impact of trauma and understand potential paths for recovery, um, to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, families, staff, and others involved with the system, to respond by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into the policies, procedures, and practices of a system, and to resist re-traumatization of children as well as the adults who care for them. And these principles are particularly important to the topic of child trauma and are instrumental in how we can build resilience to childhood trauma. So why practice trauma-informed care? Uh, Zoe and Christine did a great job at helping us define trauma, giving examples of common behaviors that may result from trauma, as well as trauma-related disorders. And I think it's also important to introduce the statistic from World Mental Health Surveys conducted by um, WHO in 2017. 
that 70.4% of respondents noted that they have experienced at least one trauma in their lives. And I think this really validates our practice of treating every individual as if they have a history of trauma. Not only are we, again, working to provide the best informed care possible, but there's also such a high chance that the individual has experienced a trauma in their lifetime. And why specifically is trauma-informed care so important when we care for children? No matter how young the child, age grants no immunity to the effects of traumatic experiences, and there's really no guarantee that a child won't develop a traumatic stress response to an incident that occurred when they were really young just as there's no guarantee that um, they may develop a traumatic stress response to an incident that they can vividly remember. And as mentioned before, everyone's response to trauma is different, and that should be respected. So even if a child has a recollection of a traumatic event or has developed a traumatic stress response, when organizations participate in trauma-informed care, children are more likely to exhibit resilience to the trauma. And this is really important because it can shape how they process their existing trauma along with how they resist re-traumatization. There have also been studies demonstrating an increase in health risk behaviors and factors in children who experience repeated exposure to trauma without treatment. These circumstances can increase health risk behaviors such as smoking, substance use, eating disorders, and high-risk activities, as well as increasing their risk of chronic health problems and a shorter lifespan. And now, stepping outside of this perspective in which we are providing care for individuals through a trauma-informed approach, what are some things that anyone can implement when we talk about trauma? And more importantly, why is it important to talk about our trauma? If anyone here needs a reason to speak on their trauma and to share, here are some reasons for you. To seek support. To better understand ourselves. How our trauma has an influence on our character, our actions, our behaviors. To understand that we are not defined by our traumas because while trauma influences, it does not have to control us. To encourage and support others in speaking about their traumas to organize and process our trauma and feelings in a less harmful and hopefully more meaningful way, and to facilitate the process of healing our trauma. And there are so many reasons, this is just a short list of reasons that are often um, shared by many and that are important to the recovery process, but everyone is going to have their own reasons and may identify with one reason more strongly than another. Now. On the other side of things, when we hear others talk about their trauma, how can we respond? We need to understand that this is a pivotal moment in the recovery process for this person, that we must allow for them to speak on their trauma, but only whenever they are ready. We don't force them to speak on it, and we don't rush them, because this is their healing process and not ours. But just because we shouldn't force them to speak on it doesn't mean we should avoid the topic either. If we choose to avoid talking about the trauma, this might validate any negative feelings they may hold against it, such as the guilt, the shame, the self-blame that Christine mentioned earlier, and that's just not helpful to the recovery process. Most importantly, be patient. Acknowledge their feelings. Don't belittle or act in a way that demeans their feelings, which I know often may not be our intention, but things like being overly optimistic telling them to look on the bright side of things, or that things could have been worse. Remarks like these just are not helpful. Even if we may feel we're helping them think positively, that's not what they need right now. And in fact, it can be quite emotionally manipulating. And we also do not want to push our own thoughts and personal feelings while they're speaking on their trauma, especially if we disagree with something they're saying, simply because it's not our time to share. This is their process, and it's really important that we respect that and help in a way that facilitates a healthy healing process. So we've talked a great deal about healing our trauma, but really, what does this process entail? Um, I'd like to share a model of one process to recover and heal from our traumas, 
And from the research I've done, these three stages are commonalities in the different models with some slight variations. So the first stage being safety and stabilization. To reestablish our feelings of security and safety, along with stability, um, this state that existed before the trauma. This includes practices that can help us gain mindfulness as well as being able to manage our post-traumatic symptoms um, if we are experiencing any. Stage two is remembrance and mourning. This is a stage where we are coming to terms with our traumatic memories, reconstructing and transforming them. This stage often requires the professional help of a psychologist or a mental health professional where you work through therapies such as EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy to help us focus on the traumatic memory and eventually reduce the vivid emotions and reality we feel from recalling that memory. And there are several other therapies, many of which Christine mentioned earlier. Stage three is reconnection and integration. At this point, we are reconciling with ourselves, reconnecting with others, and working to resolve the trauma. We are beginning to feel a greater and new sense of self, and we're not letting our traumas define us. We're integrating and acknowledging our traumatic experiences as a sense of ourselves, but are no longer letting them act as a driving force in our lives. And finally, I wanted to share two very short clips from a content creator I discovered a while back. Um, I actually came across his content on other mental health topics he's spoken on, but he shares a lot of content regarding the inner child and healing from childhood trauma, so I thought we'd share them. Even if you don't necessarily connect to these ideas or ideas like this, content clips like this can really act as little reminders to ourselves to focus on our mental health and acknowledge that communities like this do exist. Um, and when you guys watch these clips, there's this one part in the second clip, the one to the right, Healing Childhood Trauma, where he speaks about why we heal childhood trauma. It's just a way for us to love ourselves through ourselves and not through someone else like we have been our whole lives. And it's a way for us to show up for ourselves every day. And I hope that's not too cheesy for you guys, but I think it is really important because this idea of, you know, really focusing on your self-love, which we're always promoting, and not seeking external validation and love from other people, um, which we all know can not only complicate our relationship with our mental health, but specifically for this presentation, it can complicate our process of recovering from trauma. So, yeah, go check out Exploring with Micah. Um, he makes great stuff. Your inner child runs the show. Most of us, we live within the boundaries of our subconscious behavior. And I'm going to be honest with you. You're 30 years old. You're 18 years old. You're 20 years old. You're no longer 8 years old. You cannot be making decisions off of pain that you've had for 20 years. You have to heal from that so that you can make a decision that will bring you prosperity and love in your life instead of bringing you more pain and trauma. Healing childhood trauma is simply the act of loving yourself through yourself. You're not loving yourself through another person like you've done your whole life. You were showing up for all parts of your pain every day. And I guess lastly, um, I'd like to wrap up this presentation with some final thoughts and hopefully hear from you all. I was just hoping that a few of us could share our thoughts on what we may have learned or what we feel from this presentation. Do you think you feel more connected to this idea of the inner child more than you did 30 minutes ago? Um, has this helped you maybe learn new ways to navigate your conversations of trauma with people around you and your loved ones? Sort of how I feel about it. Before this presentation and really diving into the research for it, I have connected with the concept of the inner child. I just never was able to name it as such, so I didn't know that <laughs> people called it the inner child, but I do really think um, Micah says this too in his TikToks that a lot of how we act and present ourselves today 
our actions and behaviors may still be within the boundaries of what we experienced as a child. So that concept I've always um, connected to, I just never knew or named it as the inner child. Noah says, I definitely feel more connected because I didn't really have any prior knowledge beforehand. Thank you for sharing that, Noah. Um, yeah, this is what our presentations are all about, so. He continues, my mom works in child dependency law, so it is a relevant topic in her career, and I've heard some of the things that her work children have gone through. And yeah, that's so important because, oh, geez, like, I can only imagine, and I know we talked about this at the beginning, mentioning that this is just the tip of the iceberg, but when we go into um, childhood trauma, and especially when we're talking about trauma-informed systems, it's it's huge. It affects our justice systems, um, the systems of foster care, our education systems, and I can only imagine what your mom really encounters on a day-to-day -day basis, Noah, so thank you for sharing that. Angela says, thank you, Angela, such great info. <laughs> now that I understand that Letting out your inner child is not just exploring your playful side, but more about how trauma slash our past can shape our experiences and healing it. Which I really, really like that you said that because you're so right. Sometimes people say like, oh, like, I'm just a child at heart, and they associate that term and that phrase with an inner child. But perhaps there is another definition out there, and some people do perceive that to be, I'm really happy you brought that up because I think it also points to the fact that we are now sort of normalizing these conversations of mental health and, um, you know, people are maybe more willing to share and speak on their traumas that we kind of are coining a new um, phrase and maybe it's been coined for a while, but yeah, I really like that you brought that up. So for time's sake, we will end our presentation now, but I really want to thank everyone for sharing. I know a topic like this, it does take a lot um, to speak about and to reflect on. So I want you to know that your thoughts and feelings are so appreciated and so respected here. Thanks again for sharing. And the past slide, it was a slide with all of the resources we used to create this presentation. As always, you can find them in the description box in case you'd like to reference them. But thank you again. Please take the time to recharge after this presentation and we will talk soon.